is because I talked about how the Western audience can kind of uh, how do I how do I phrase this? They're generally not as receptive as they could or possibly should be to Eastern storytelling methods. Um, one of the big differences, probably the biggest difference between Eastern and Western storytelling, is that Western star storytelling puts a huge emphasis on the self. That is, it's about how you feel, and it's about how you experience the world and, and all this other stuff. And it happens to be that you fall into a bigger narrative. Whereas with Eastern storytelling, it's usually more about the bigger narrative, the big picture, uh, the, the mass being affected. And that just kind of comes down to a cultural thing, whereas over here in the West, we put a, a huge emphasis on individuality. Whereas in the East, it's more about how do you how do you fit into the into the grand scope of things? Are you doing your part to be a part of you know the mass as opposed to trying to be as individual as possible? And their stories tend to reflect that. Um, almost any time you look at their folklore, their mythology, you know, and all the different kinds of creatures that show up, you'll notice that. Oftentimes, it's usually an individual who has done something particularly bad, and now they're suffering for just for that, whatever that reason that was, for all of eternity. Or they go and prey on individuals who are not acting in the best interest of the group at large. So it creates a different kind of narrative yeah, dynamic that the Western most of the time Westerners are really to place used a, to. a stronger emphasis on, you know, the hero that you know, saves the word they and stuff like that. Um, yeah, yeah. Definitely a lot, generally characters that are a lot stronger as opposed to characters that, you know, exhibit a weakness, at least from what I've seen personally. Did you want to say something, Words? No, um, it's just, I, uh, specifically Western versus Eastern is not something I've, I've spent a great deal of time um, thinking about. So I'm a little disarmed, but just, just thinking about it, and like the most the most uh, present one in my mind as far as games go, the, the Legend of Zelda. Even though even though Link is is his own is his own character, the the greater emphasis has always been on the um, the world uh, and, and high rule and the implications of this larger conflict. And then and then here comes Link playing his role to set things right. Naturally, that that's a great, great example you just made there, because in every Legend of Zelda game, or damn near every Legend of Zelda game, Link can always be named. Even though we know his name is Link, we can give him whatever name that we want, which is really interesting, like looking at Ocarina of Time, but then they they kind of established that Link is kind of this timeless character. He's like a rolling reincarnation thing. So it's it has nothing to do with the individual Link that you're playing. Like, this is the kid who happens to be born as Link, but he's not even given his own kind of unique personality. It's He represents, like, you know, he's, he's a higher form of being in that sense. You know, he kind of, in a way, falls into the, the classic, you know, Japanese mythos of these particular and very powerful beings. And that role that he plays is worth more than he is as an individual. We look at Link, and it's his job to go and set things right as far as this conflict of power. You know, he's the hero of courage. That's how he's referred to. We don't go, oh, Link, that one kid that lives down the street. They go, no, he represents this specific thing, yeah, and that's there's what a lot he's of here for. Destiny. He has no there's other a lot agency. Of destiny, he has you know, no other life outside of that play thing. When it comes to main characters from eastern design games for the most part and western games typically are kind of anybody's that rose up and became that through their own actions not that i'm saying that you know eastern heroes don't do that it's more of their kind of fitted the destiny and western characters usually just kind of rise from the mud hmm. right you know you really look at that stuff and it the, the more you examine it, the more apparent it becomes. Look at uh, SMT3 Nocturne. 
the demi fiend is just kind of there and it's not even about this guy individually and what he wants it's everyone is pulling this guy who has way too much power in every direction possible because everyone knows they need him on their side if they want to succeed so it, the individualness is removed from the picture uh, hell even look at harvest moon you sit down you play harvest moon and it doesn't matter which one you're playing it has very little to do with the person that you're playing and how you can go and make the world and life better for all the other villagers or how you can contribute to solving their problems nobody you know comes to the character's house and say hey you know what's going on with you I heard you got a problem can i help you without that about you know with that no they're like i've got a problem and you've got to come along and you have to solve it there's you know just little personal or there's very little expression of the self you can look at Dragon's Dogma, and it's the same way. It starts off, you're just some random kid that nobody really cared about in a village, but then suddenly the dragon shows up, and now you've got the Dark this big Souls, role you to carry play. the mark no, of you the don't really get or whatever it's called to choose. You know, like an actual or, mark on you. Hell, yeah, the dark sign. Right, you know, you've got the the dark sign. You're fulfilling a destiny. You're fulfilling a great, grand legend. Or if you even look at, let's go back further, instead of just using current stuff, you can see that it still happens there. Uh, Chrono, same way. He has little personal agency. Nobody cares about his life or Chrono's mom or what his cat is doing, any of that stuff. But he's got all this responsibility to do this thing, and he doesn't have a choice. Or you can look at Suikoden uh, 1 and Suikoden 2, particularly Suikoden 2. Where if the main character, you know, he's he's lost everything. He's lost his his family, you know, his adoptive father. He's just got his sister in the world. And Joey, you know, his best friend, has a lot of agency. And he cares about his own life. And because he cares about his own life and how that's going to play out, he's actually painted as the villain. Whereas the main character who makes all these sacrifices for the greater good not focusing on his self, that's considered the hero as far as the, the cycle goes. And there's a point in the story where you can choose to abandon the campaign, so to speak. You can walk away from being the leader of this army. And if you have one chance kind of one chance to go back on that decision, if you do, a lot of you know, a lot of people get killed. And your strategist walks up and slaps you in the face and tells you that you're being basically being a selfish shit. And it's like, well, wait a minute, nobody asked this kid if he wanted to do this. He was thrust in here. He didn't have a choice. And they berate you for not making, for not going along for the greater good. It's just, it's, it's a consistent theme between the, you know, two different sides. Indiv individuality yeah. versus Another difference yeah. the I've greater good and what's best of for design the people games, and the culture. Uh, a lot of these threats are very uh, kind of like angelic or otherworldly or out of this world, like, literally, you get Lavos, for example, or, you know, sometimes you even fucking fight God in these games. And a lot of times with Western RPGs, from what I've noticed, it's more of kind of against your own people, kind of like other civilizations, or other people with just different ideals. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's a little more it's a little more grounded, whereas, yeah, they, they, they like to tackle, like, mythological forces, almost. Absolutely. Like yeah. The way that I explained it in the in the lecture that I gave, I, I pointed out that exact thing that you said, and I said they like to use those big, you know, gods and and yeah. crazy different creatures. They use them as metaphor, actually, to explain uh, different kinds of human-based problems. I, I'm not sure why they do, but that's the easiest way for them to convey that information. Like, think about the different types of ghosts, and it's like, this is a ghost of a person who committed suicide, and they brought great shame on their family. Like, that's pretty damn specific, but that's the kind of stuff that they do. Uh, God, just... Just like you said, um, just the different gods. I mean, you've got all of Persona 3, which, yeah. or just not Persona 3, just Persona period, where they draw from 
all the folklore in the entire world. Uh, just M S SMT, period, by itself. They make that huge distinction to pull from this huge mythology, and they, they frame human problems as personified, you know, or anthropomorphic things in existence. This is a beast that's just pure gluttony, you know, like it's gluttony incarnate, and it just walks around eating everyone and everything, and when they're telling stories, they're basically trying to say, don't be a glutton, or you're going to turn yeah. into yeah. a giant, fat, crazy-looking monster. Did you want to say something? Like, I know they no, just I go about it in a really weird I, way. I agree completely, and this is this is really fascinating stuff. I, oh, yeah. If, you're le if your lecture is up anywhere, I'd love to listen to it. Yeah, we'll get to accolades near the end. Oh, your mic's going crazy again. <laughs> you, yeah, it's like a band. But now, um... Uh, what I've noticed is Eastern games take a lot more suspension of disbelief as well. Uh, very, very, they tend to be very fantastical, very magical in nature. Like, you're going to be like, all right, well, there's pixies, there's this, you know, tree of life. You know, you really have to step into a whole new world and kind of acknowledge that not just that these kind of typological, typolog typical uh, fantastical creatures like a minotaur might exist need to step in and be like okay this fucking world has a goddamn tree that is the tree of life where Gaia mm -hmm. is very much a real thing and you need to understand that the whole world believes this and you need to have more of a suspension of disbelief and kind of put more get yourself more uh, into the story at least that's what, what I found out I'm not saying that's necessarily mm -hmm. good or bad yeah, no, I think whether whether that's good or bad is is up to perspective, I guess. But I think specifically, or no, in in the case of of uh, Japan specifically, I th think that might um, in some part be a result of just their their like demeanor as a culture. Like they're very much about not inconveniencing others, and uh, or at least historically, and um, like. Uh, very understated and keeping your, your emotions under control. So I think because of that, that, that reflects like on the complete other side of the spectrum in their, uh, in their media, which might also speak to why their TV is so strange. <laughs> Maybe one can only hope. Let's see if I missed any other questions. Did you have anything else you wanted to say about Eastern versus Western, or do you guys have a preference perhaps? You know, um, here's a really interesting crossover problem uh, that kind of happens. I, I see people talking about Evil Within, and that, you know, made me think about Resident Evil. You remember when the first Resident Evil came out, and a lot of it didn't make sense for Americans? Like, you're dealing with Americans, you're dealing with, uh, you know, supposedly, quote-unquote, white people, but... We made fun of the dialogue and things like, you know, you were Master almost a Jill Lock sandwich, Bay. and you got to deal yeah. with, uh, you know, a Jill, the master of unlocking. Like, we're sitting here going, who the fuck would say that? Like, it, 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 so it's kind of weird when you see people cross that, that line to, we're going to make this content, but we're going to make this content from, that basically represents a different culture than ours and how you can kind of slip up because of that. Um, mm -hmm. I think clearly, I mean, they, they obviously got better. I mean, you know, they, they, got, they got better at dealing with dialogue like that, but those are the different kind of types of problems that can happen when you try to cross the cultural barrier and create content like the other side. Um, I think Resident Evil was successful because they brought about westernized content, you know, dealing with regular cops. They're going around, they're roughing stuff up, but they brought Japanese-style uh, game development to the table. Like, one thing I don't hear people often complain about with many Japanese games is that they're generally way less buggy, you know? Like, they're really, really strict about how they go about producing their games. That's not to say that there aren't bugs. I'm just saying that if you look at big Japanese releases versus Western releases, 
one tends to be kind of a lot more stable than the other. So I think it's, it's really interesting. I would, would like to see more Japanese development practices brought in line with Americanized storytelling or just Western in general storytelling. I think that we can do a lot of good with that. Um, great example, uh, Castlevania Lords of Shadow. Like, I'd love to see that very serious westernized take on Castlevania lore, and they're kind of approaching that stuff from our method of storytelling of the individual self. Even though Gabriel's out there trying to save the world again, but, you know, they, they took a very grim tone with yeah, it yeah. through Mercury Steam, you know. It's the end times, like the world is going to end, and all of that stuff. But you could also see where the game suffered because they used, you know, a Western-based development method. Like the game, the gameplay was really questionable to me. Like just overall. And so I would have would have preferred to see, hey, you guys come in here, you handle the story on this, and we'll tell it in that way versus we'll develop it in your method. A part of that 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 also comes about is that look at Kojima. Okay, like dealing with Metal Gear, some of that plot stuff goes way the hell over people's head because even though you're dealing with these very westernized characters and stuff like that, they still follow, he's, he's using Japanese method, right, so they're talking about weird stuff and having weird jokes that might make us stop and take pause and go, what the hell are you talking about? But then they start talking about huge stuff, things that are past the individual. You know, the end of Metal Gear Solid 2, he's talking about information, you know, the information control, and the Patriots are doing this, and it turns into this huge meta story that's above, it's like above the paper right, of every character in the actual story. Deck that, uh, I was going, actually playing the Metal Gear games for the first time ever, uh, and he said he'd like to come on and talk, but you guys are the guest of honor, so you want me to bring him on or no? And don't feel bad if you say no, I mean, we took time to arrange this. All right. Yeah, by all means. All right, I'll let him know. But um, More I'm than more, uh, Eastern myself, I guess, if I had to choose between the two. I, I like a very mythological kind of... I like symbolism and stuff like that. Not necessarily, you know, oh, is this so deep, but... I like uh, games that have a motif that kind of just runs along the entirety of the game. Uh, uh, I mean, and, and just to answer, answer the question on my end, I'm... Uh, I'm... I'm more or less agnostic on that. I, I like both. I appreciate both for their own things. Okay. I had another question here. Let me go and grab it. Uh, Potato Wielder asks, do you think we will ever get epic storytelling again in video games? 1, 2, and 3 were awesome. Six was or Final Fantasy VI was awesome. Xenogear... And he says that games nowadays he feels like eye candy, and he wants to know... Uh, do you think well versus games that rival those games or games like Planescape Torment? And his definition of an epic game is, you know, games that have great stories that are of significant length. Hmm. Also, welcome Johnny Pinball. Nice to be here. Welcome. Um, I guess just in uh, how I feel about his question and just uh, uh, well, I'll, I'll address I'll address his his definition of a good uh, story, and then I'll, I'll I'll try to answer the question. I I don't necessarily agree that that a story that has to be really long to to be good, but I do I do recognize what he's saying. He wants he wants to feel like he got a lot out of I got a lot out of the experience. Um, so I I can't really answer the question of like will there be games with great great games in the future. Uh, or again, rather. But I can say that I'm trying. I, I I definitely want to try to create something that's meaningful and impactful and and long. And yeah, I think I think yeah, I'm playing through Xenoblade Chronicles uh, right now myself, and that that seems pretty uh, a lot of what he he he's looking for specifically. And uh, yeah, like what Owned is, is saying, Bastion had a fantastic story. Uh, arguably, that was. The, I mean, not arguably, that was the greatest part of that game. Um, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. But I, just, I can't answer the question of just like, uh, when will they come back? I can say, or if they'll I, come back. If they'll come back. I can say, I'm certainly, I certainly want to try. 
Uh, do you have something to say through dog? Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, actually, I can answer that question. Um, it, yeah, it's simple. Um, when console cycles get longer, here's what ended up happening. If you look back in time, you'll notice that we had long, long gaps between new hardware. Hardware would usually last somewhere between, I don't know, let's say five to ten years, right? And what ended up happening is that our cycles kept getting shorter and shorter, right? So we, we had a console come out, and it would be, you know, just a couple of years. Like the PS2 came out, what, 99, 2000 or whatever? And then, boom, not too long after that, the PS3, bop, just drops right on our heads. And so what's happened is that developers and publishers and all that, they have to scramble to learn new technology and all that. Nobody got too much of a chance to settle into hardware, and it's like... This is what the hardware can absolutely positively do. So we can't push graphics anymore. We can't push, you know, CPU cycles, all that stuff. So we have to focus on creating actual compelling content and doing cool things with it. So what ends up happening is that, you know, we've dealt with this whole thing where everyone is right here at the start of this generation. Okay, we got PS4, Xbox One, and... You know, you know how the beginning of a console life cycle is. Like, those are usually the worst games that are going to come out for that hardware. Like, just graphically, optimization-wise, all that stuff. I mean, come yeah. on, let's talk about Cameo Elements of Power, you know, on the 360. It definitely doesn't... It's not indicative of what the final product is. It's just... They're, like, very, very well put together tech demos for the system. Like, this is some of the stuff that we can really, really do with this, and it just happens to be a retail product. What happens is that as people become more and more settled into hardware and hardware cycles get longer, that's when you start seeing the really cool stuff coming around, the things that are most memorable. So my prediction is that when... Epic game or epic storytelling will come back when there's less emphasis on graphics because we'll, we're going to hit a technological wall here. There's going to come a point where, like, let's say, just for sake of argument, just, you know, as an example, let's say that the wall is photorealism. We can create nothing more realistic looking. You, it's almost indistinguishable from the real thing. That's the wall. Boom. Just like that. So what do you do from that point? Well, the only thing left to do is to focus on other areas of, of the game. You have to focus on actual gameplay. You have to focus on that narrative. It, different things like that. It's, a, it's like looking at film. You know, initially when film first started, there wasn't a whole lot going on. Movies were really short, and they had so many technological hurdles. You know, there was no color, there was no sound, and so they could only do what they could with what they had. But as it got easier and easier and easier to produce those things easily, we started getting more and more complex stories that came from that. I mean, it, it, something like Braveheart wouldn't be technologically feasible, you know, back when film was first created. Or, you know, we get, you know, there's there's always a point where someone pushes the barrier. They push it harder than anyone else. And that's when you get amazing things like, uh, like Spartacus. Or you have a technological marvel for its time period, like Titanic. It's like, holy crap, it really catches people off guard. So when we're going to get those stories back again, we're going to have the huge sweeping narratives that people pour everything into because they don't have right. to worry have, about everything have, else. That's for sure. Oh, okay. Uh, well, I just um, wanted to... I've never Got actually, it. I've actually never actually thought about it that way. That's really interesting. I, I, I hope you I can forgive me for asking you a question, but what do you think about the possibility of like if there's a lack of an like a lack of an emphasis on the the consoles in general in the future, like in regards to that? Mm. Well, that's you know that's great because that's the other wall. Hey, you notice with this generation that. The PS4 and the Xbox One yeah, are absolutely. more like PCs than they are separate hardware. Like, it's just like that. And so eventually we're going to hit, uh, again, a convergence on that idea. And we're kind of starting that already. We've got the Steam Box, which is just a PC that's specifically designed to hook up to your TV. Like, that's what it's specializing in. 
And so once we hit that technological convergence on that idea of, well, everyone's basically running hardware or whatever that's pretty damn similar to each other, or so on and so forth, once that less emphasis is placed on, you know, the, the separate stuff, once we get, you know, focused on that, yeah. that's when uh, we'll for see me, people make I that think that they just I don't think we're going to see an epic storytelling make a return anytime soon. And, like, you know, the PS1 was definitely, like, the glory days of these, you know, long, epic RPGs that were coming out. Uh, the biggest barrier to entry is technology and production costs, and as long as these costs remain high, we're not going to see games that are significantly long. I mean, take a look at any, you know, typical adventure or shooter game. They're not really going to be that long in length compared to these epic games, though, you know, those types of games generally aren't that long to begin with, you know, shooters and adventure games necessarily. Yeah, yeah, no, that's that's fascinating. So I think um, the champ, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. I think the oh, best yeah. place to look is actually handhelds. I think because the idea is when it becomes uh, cheaper to produce uh, graphics that are acceptable or with graphics that are acceptable, that's when it becomes uh, capable or that's when you're going to start seeing it make a resurgence. And another thing you need to consider is that uh, voice acting is that costs some money these days. I don't think it's necessarily enough to really break the bank, but a lot of these epic games didn't have to deal with that. It was strictly text that you were reading. And this is just a whole nother layer of cost that's put on top of game production these days especially rpgs i I think another challenge in um making a game of length nowadays would be with uh oh Um, um, i think another challenge in making a game to length uh nowadays of of something like with you know we would see on playstation one or the early days of playstation two um it's the the problem with it is that, you know, you got to keep the player's interest throughout that entire time. You don't want to leave them at a point where they, they feel either burned out by having done the same thing for most of the game or, you know, want you don't want them to want to drop out at any point. That's another challenge on top of technology and budget, which it's getting harder and harder nowadays to get investors that would be interested in making a game that's really long that isn't, you know, MMO or doesn't have some other additional money-making aspect other than just buying the software. Yeah, definitely. Mm-hmm. Anyone else you know, have anything? I, What's up? You know, I... You, you, no, you made a great point uh, about the handhelds that actually kind of proved my point. Um, we, we all know that handhelds, for the most part, are just... They're weaker than dedicated, you know consoles or PC. You're just not going to get the same graphic fidelity. You're not going to get the same detail. You just cannot push those specs as hard as, you know, those other things. So what ends up happening is the same thing. Like the ceiling for graphics and that type of of, uh, design, it's really low on that hardware. So then you're left with two options. You focus on your gameplay, focus on your story. You know, you have to create something really cool and something really unique to get people's attention on the, in the handheld space. And so that's why, you know, handheld games always have this really cool, really different experiences that you usually won't see yeah. on the bigger systems and things like that. And I think that's, that's kind of what, what I'm getting at is that when we hit that point where there's going to be a ceiling where if everyone is producing photorealism, no one can compete in the graphics space, which means that they're going to have to compete somewhere else. And it will come back, come back down to, for games that have a focus on story, everyone's going to be trying to tell the best stories. And people are going to focus on having the most unique or exciting or different gameplay experiences. There's a ceiling that will always have to get reached. And that's when you'll yeah, see that stuff come small back small into play because there's nowhere see, else to go. I already think there's a good variety, but I think you'll see an even greater variety of like um, art direction. Like, because everything looking photorealistic, it's just going to be boring. All right. Did you have anything else you wanted to add to this, um, Pinball? No, no. Um, you know, I, I do think um, I do think an issue with handheld games is the way that um, there's. The, I'm still getting the feeling of a stigma, a stigma that uh, um, that they're meant for kind of quick play, which for some people, the way they, the way they schedule things that really, that can be the case. Um, although it's, you know, it's, it's hard to establish a, an, an experience of length on a handheld, unless it's been previously established like the Metal Gear Solid. I mean, 
I, I wouldn't just kind of pick that up and, and play it for five minutes and put it back down. That's something where I would feel obligated to at least get a good part of a, a mission, no matter how long it is in before I put it back down. Um, I, I still do have little arcade ports or, you know, stuff on the, on my um, PS Vita or 3DS for really quick, you know, things where I'm like on, on the bus or something and I still need to be paying attention. But, um, you know, I, I, I've that develops over time, the uh, appreciation for longer experiences on handhelds. So. Yeah. And how, how are you enjoying uh, Metal Gear Solid 1? Do you this is, you had beaten it for the first time, right? Not too long ago. Um, I didn't. I didn't quite beat it, but um, I, I. I'm just the, There's something about it that I was just really garbage at it. Um, in a, in a way that I was able to kind of pick up the yeah, the um the PS2 ones the the PS2 one I think uh, Metal Gear Solid 2 was um, much easier I think for me to you know be able to pick up. I, I don't know what it was about it. So um, I'm gonna try it on the PS3 instead of the PS Vita where I'll have the uh, option of uh, analog control, but. Um, yeah, no, it's it's definitely. Yeah, I, I can really see the fuss about it. So, <laughs> all right, uh, we got another suggestion here and pseudo question. Uh, bu- 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 even though gaming is a very young medium, do you think games rely too much on film with regards to storytelling? What do you guys think is an example of a story that could only be told through the video- medium of a video game? Seven, we got first. Oh, that's a um, okay. That, that's go a damn first. good question. Somebody else go first. Okay. I need to think on that for just uh, a second. Yeah, you can go if you had something to say. Well, I was just, I was just going to say immediately it comes to mind. The only thing that I can't imagine replicating in like written text or film or something like that is um, emergent narratives, where that's not really, that's not really uh, storytelling in and of itself, but um, that's just one thing that comes to mind. Um, I don't. That's th- no, okay. I, I'm not sure about um, if video games are stealing too much from Hollywood. Uh, I mean, you know, Hollywood's trying to rip off books. Books are trying to rip off of bards going around telling stories and campfire stories, and games are trying to rip off something else. I mean, it's. I don't think it's necessarily these are trying to rip off one another. I mean, stories are stories, and I don't think how it's delivered to you. Um, necessarily makes too big of an impact there are certainly benefits to the variety of ways i mean reading a book is definitely different from seeing a movie and there's benefits and disadvantages to each yeah and there's but a at difference. the end of the day that a story can still be made within any of these mediums on its own yeah and yeah. and just like to in the case of games interactivity adds a different element to the storytelling that's what it's that's its unique draw um it, it, I, I realize I didn't answer before my feelings on the, the borrowing too much. I don't, I don't know that you necessarily can borrow too much unless you're just like flat out copying the format, in which case you're making a movie. Um, I mean, I guess you can, but it, it, like storytelling is is kind of uh, a, a universal craft, and the, the the different the different mediums have different methods for for bringing it out. Uh, I don't think I don't think that game designers and developers can uh, can do anything other than than gain and learn from borrowing from uh, uh, conventions of other mediums. Definitely. And uh, as for uh, what can a video game do differently, I think the best thing that video games has going for it is adaptability with regards to story. I mean, a movie you are exploring a very linear story and they are choose your own adventure books, but they don't really flesh out that much Um, with video games. You know, there are, there is a world that you can explore at your own, um, you know, with however you approach it, there are open world games. And if you want to go see different parts and different stories, you can, and that isn't really something that you can find in books or even movies. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't go to a certain timestamp in a movie and, Suddenly, I'm learning about you know medieval Europe or anything like that. I'm not learning about a specific place in the fictional world. And the same with books. I mean, there's only forward when it comes to books and movies. But with video games, not all of them, but some of them, there's very much a you can go anywhere yeah, there's a little, and there's explore a lot of, at your own you know pace. Yeah, there's a lot of tangent, tangential stuff. Um, just touch a little bit on what Gwen was saying here. Um, 
that's kind of what I was trying to touch on with with emergent uh, narratives in games. So, for instance, there's this again. I'm bringing up an indie game. There's this game called The Spire coming out in a while by the Hitbox by uh, Hitbox team. I think they're called. They they did Dust Force, and the idea there is this 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 uh, procedurally generated tower, and you just kind of you have to explore it and try to get to the top, and you're faced with tons and tons of different types of enemies and and maps and stuff like that. And so like your story kind of emerges from that, and that's kind of that's kind of the ideal for branching, right? You're 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 presented with more or less a sandbox. It has a little structure and context, but it's it's a sandbox and and it just kind of comes out organically. As far as branching in in a more conventional uh, storytelling uh, situation, uh, it's it's a little more difficult because when you start saying like, okay, this can branch off in this direction, this can branch off in this direction, that and that and that and that, you get to the point where your writer is so bogged down with with different possibilities that it's just any sort of coherent theme that they're trying to present uh, gets lost. Um, and it's hard to convey much of any worth in that sense. So in, you get just a bunch of different endings that don't really amount to diddly squat. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, and another thing I'd like to mention is the idea of failing to progress a story. If you're playing an RPG and you get killed by the boss, you're not seeing the fucking next cutscene. You're going back to the load screen or the save point or whatever the hell you want to call it. And that's definitely unique. And, you know, looking at it from the outside, it seems kind of ridiculous, this whole idea that, you know, you can suddenly discontinue enjoying the experience of a story because you weren't good enough or you weren't, you know, strong enough. But at the same time, that's what makes a lot of these games great to me personally. Yeah. Um, and I just, I kind of want to, sorry, I don't mean to blow you off. I just kind of want to entertain what what, entertain no, it's what Gwen is saying. And yeah, I don't disagree that it, it can't happen. It's just, you're going to need, you're going to need more than one writer. Uh, it uh, certainly, because uh, most writers, when they go into a story, they, they want to write something and they have a specific end goal in mind. And it's, you can you can put everything in your power in there to to give as much care to other other branches, other endings, and whatnot. But at the end of the day, you're you, the the a single writer is going to be interested in one specific theme that they're trying to present. I think so. You would need a, a larger writing team to make something like that and make them uh, uh, have any worth. I think. Um, so yeah, that's just sort of how I feel about that. Yeah, and as for a story that I think can only be delivered through a video game, I would, I would say something like uh, an Elder Scrolls game. Uh, not necessarily that the main story couldn't be delivered; it very well could be. But a lot of the times with those games, it's a lot of the stuff on the side that really intrigues you. It's all the exploration and the why it could never be done is that when you're playing a video game, whatever you are pursuing especially in an open world game, whatever you are actively pursuing, that is where the spotlight is with regards to narrative, because you are dictating the pace of the story. Like, yeah, you might be subjected to certain elements of storytelling, like a cutscene or, you know, a character attacking you or whatever the hell. But, you know, if you decide to go and do some random side quest, that's where you're focusing your attention. And a movie and a book just couldn't follow such a, you know, disconnected narrative did you think of an answer three dog uh let's let's hear it man yes i did um it's a it's a great question because i i really wanted to think on this um because it's a complex question but it's the question one of the types of questions that needs to be asked regarding storytelling um you know, the first part of the question was, do games rely, rely too much on lifting storytelling from film? My answer is no. The reason is, is that each type of medium produces a different result. And there's going to be some natural bleed over between them. Like, let's say, what are the, the, the big storytelling mediums? Let's say books, so writing, film, which is visual, and then you've got video games, which touches 
something that none of those other mediums can do. If 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 you write a book and someone is reading it, they're imagining it. It's in their head. Whatever you've written, you know, your job is to try and make that image as vivid as possible. It's kind of like reception, you know, with static. You know, some people are really, really good at giving you a clear picture, others not so much. And then you've got, you know, you've, you've got comics and film, and I, I would actually lump those two together in the same category because they're visual. You use your eyes. They, they are showing you exactly what they want you to see. There's a little less imagining going on. Of course, you're going to be imagining the things that are happening in between those frames. Um, like in a comic, they, they, they have panels, and there's stuff that happens between those panels, and your, it's your job to piece together what led from this panel to the next one. So they're still imagining, not as much as with the book, but pretty similar. Film, the same thing is that with people, you wonder about what's going on on the, you know, the other side. What's, what's, what's going on that I currently am not seeing. Video games touch a whole different category that these cannot touch. They cannot explore that space. That space being, rather than thinking it or seeing it, you're living it. You are experiencing that narrative. And that's why, you know, video games can touch people in a way that that a film cannot touch or that uh, a, a book cannot touch. You know, I wanted to touch on the uh, Grand Theft Auto V and the, the torture okay. scene situation. And you guys yeah, all played, GTA, you played through that okay, section, okay. right? Okay, so the, there's a part in the game where you're playing as Trevor and you have to interrogate this guy and you go through this torture sequence. And they make you do it. Like, you're not watching a cutscene. You are torturing this person. And at first, my immediate reaction was, I was like, I am really not comfortable with this. I don't, I'm like, it's one thing to watch it, but it's, a, I'm like, why didn't they make it a cutscene? Why didn't they, they uh, give me an option to skip it even? But then I, I, before I went off and reacted, I stopped and really thought about it. And I said, no, they had to make me do it. Because, I mean, we all talk, you know, torture has been a thing that's been in our discussion for the past decade or whatever. And it would take the weight away from it if you didn't do it yourself. If it was a cutscene, you could, you wouldn't be as connected to that sequence and it wouldn't be as impactful. I think the point that they were trying to make with that sequence is rather than just telling you, oh, this thing is bad, or showing you this thing is bad, making you do it yourself and making you feel bad for doing it, I think was the intent of that sequence. No other medium can touch that. They, they, they can't get there. Video games, I wrote an article on this some time ago. I said, I think that video games are the last like it's the end game of storytelling there's nowhere else to go now that doesn't mean that i think that video games as we currently are playing them are that end game but i mean let's think about video games as they are okay we interface through usually a controller using our our eyes and our ears and whatnot but then we look at stuff like the star trek holodeck where people are able to come up with these very vivid simulations of times and places or even stuff completely made up but people are in there they're in this space and that and they're interacting so based on that you know with the question that you asked uh, the second part is there an example of a story that could only be told through the medium of a video game i would say no what i would say is that some mediums are more efficient at telling a particular type of story for example, look at Prince of Persia. Okay, we, you know, Prince of Persia, Sands of Time came out, gameplay, you know, rewinding time when you make mistakes or you get killed, things like that. And, it tra and then the film came out. It didn't do as great as hoped. It's the same story, it's the same content, but it just didn't click for people. You know, so it's the same stuff that's there. It's all the same components. But people are much more receptive to the game and actually performing those actions rather than being shown or yeah. told about uh, those actions. There's a great point that I wanted to touch on that you brought up when that was the uh, comic panel or the comic book panels, how there's action that happens in between these p the panels and that you <clears throat> you as a reader need to 
kind of insert yourself or at least have an idea of what's happening and paint it yourself, and that's part of what makes it enjoyable. Uh, one flaw that I feel with movies in this regard is that because it's a constant, you know, always on, you know, yeah, you, you could in theory pause it and reflect on what's happening, but, you know, there is usually something always happening that you want to pay attention to. So you can't actively, like, think about that. Whereas with a game, you know, there is pause. And then, you know, because you're doing it at your own pace, it's not really too big of an issue. If that makes sense. Yeah. And, and uh, Scanner in the, the chat added, yeah. added an, uh, a decent example. The, uh, the shooting in the airport in Modern Warfare 2. Like, uh, yeah, no Russian. No Russian. Yeah, no Russian. That no Russian thing. I mean, say what you want about the 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 Call of Duty series, but that that instance wouldn't have had half the impact if they just told you about it. Like if it was just one of their briefing cutscenes. Yeah. Do you have a a thought about this, um, Pinball? And I know you had a friend that wanted to join Words. If you want to give him the info, that's fine by me. Unless anyone objects no. to it. You don't uh, think... No, but I was I was going to bring up that um, that uh, mission in uh, Call of Duty: Modern Warfare Two. Uh, there, yeah, there's definitely some uh, interesting stuff that happened. There's even, um, especially at the end too, where you uh, have to do the thing at the end. I don't want to spoil it for anyone. That's that, I think that was the last like legitimately good Call of Duty game. That's I, I stayed on that for for quite a long time. But uh, um, yeah, that's that one. Yeah, that. Is is spot on. That wouldn't have had any impact actually if they just had one picture of a newspaper. I'm just trying to. I'm picturing it right now. If they just had a newspaper or something instead of just going through the level, 15, you know, all 15 minutes of it. So definitely. Uh, welcome to the conversation. Um, is there a name you like to go by, or can I go by what you have here on Mumble? I'm just going to call him Rev then, since he joined, but he might be setting up his mic and stuff still. Yeah, I think he might be setting up his mic. Okay, that's fine. Uh, let's see if we had any other questions here. But yeah, if you guys have a question, go ahead and put it in. Great discussion so far, and thanks again to everyone that's uh, taking part in watching. Yeah, this has been a lot of fun. Oh yeah, definitely. I enjoy doing like this stuff like this. It's been a while since I've used Mumble. Is my microphone working? Yeah, what's up? How's it going? Eh, not bad. Playing waste fun. Just wanted to pop in because Words was uh, on LinkedIn earlier. I'm on the same VN thing as the writer as he is. Oh, you guys are the... We haven't told the stream about this, but you guys are working on a game. Uh, you and Words. Uh, it's not a video game. It's a visual novel. All right. Well, you're working on a visual novel. <laughs> yeah. You're working on my next uh, pleasure. Your next zero out of ten. <laughs> yeah. So, why don't you? Do you want to tell us a little bit about us, about it, or yourself? Um. Well, I'm a recent university graduate. Um, I'm doing a graduate certificate in ESL, and I don't want to do that as a job. So. As a side thing, I like to write and hopefully be able to do that as my main job. But okay. um, other than that, I think that I'll let words divulge more about the project if he wants to. Yeah, it so never hurts to show. In, uh, because we kind of came in here without telling anybody else <laughs> until now. Yeah. yeah. Well, go ahead and pitch it, words. Uh, sure. Um, uh, I don't know. We're... <laughs> do it okay uh we're working on a visual novel uh called some experience required it's a story oh of, boy it's a story about a young man uh who uh-huh uh who uh who is kind of down on his luck he he is a, he graduated from college did everything he was supposed to and ended up unemployed when the uh, market tanked. And we jump in on the story when he's trying to pick himself back up and figure out what he's going to do with himself for the next year or two or longer. And he goes around trying to find work and meets a lot of interesting people. And 
just it kind of branches off from there. There are uh, there are four paths that I don't want to go into specifics about, but we're gonna we're all trying to. There, there's four riders, one for each path, and we're each trying to tackle uh, themes that are personal to ourselves in the and also different, world. So that we're not like covering the same themes with every path. Yeah. And uh, anybody that's a fan of visual novels, it's not set in the high school. Uh, like, that's out of the question. All right, well, he just lost everybody. Yeah. Oh. Huh. Are the that's girls okay. underage, at least? No. Yeah, are they at least crippled? Oh, God. Um, okay. Uh, <laughs> but no, there's, well, there's, no there's no harem, if you're <laughs> curious, King Alicious. We'll be on Kickstarter soon, and if we get enough money, we will put realistic damage so that you can make them crippled <laughs> if you so choose. No, no. Okay, okay. It's I, I should I should emphasize that it is a free project. We're doing it for for, I mean we're we're passionate about it, but it is on a voluntary basis. It is for fun. It's because we love the idea and we wanted to run with it. Okay. That that sounds good. Uh, we look forward and, to it. Um, you c uh, there's nothing on the, on there yet. But uh, one sec here. Yeah, you can just put the link in chat. Yeah. So, what kind of game or stories and games do you enjoy normally, Prev? Do you normally just play visual novels, or? Uh, no, I play a, a variety of games. Usually, um, well, since I was a kid, I played like shooters, like Half Life Two and stuff. Um, recently, though, I've been playing a lot of uh, Stalker and Metro, and right now I'm playing uh, Wasteland Two. So I don't really have um, a single type of story that I like the most. Also, I did my education in English literature, so it sort of exposed me to like a really, really, really wide range of stories. So I don't know. I just don't really have a favorite method. It just depends on the execution. Do you think video game stories can hold up to actual books or movies? Um, the thing is that... Video games have something that um, other mediums don't, and that's the interactive element. And a lot of people don't want to interact with something if it's not fun. Which poses a problem, because how can you tell a story that's not fun, but keep the mechanics fun? It's not impossible. There's games like... Um, Papers, oh, Please. Called? Yeah, Papers, Please. Thank you. Um, that You know, they do that perfectly. But it's really, really difficult. And even then, some people can't deal with it. Like, I knew someone who tried to play Cart Life, and it was just so depressing to him that he just couldn't do it. Like, it just drove him nuts. Like, I, oh, it's the sorry. difficult balance. Sorry. No, it's my bad. No, go ahead. go ahead. Pinball. What's up, Pinball? Oh, no, no. I was going to say that that's. Um... I think the, there's a, a more more of an emotional involvement with um, interactivity, where it really puts you into the perspective of the main character, which um, I have not. I, I must admit, I've not uh, touched um, Papers Please, but it's it's definitely something I need to at least do in a, do in one sitting. I feel yeah, like I so. recommend it. It's a very short game. You can definitely do it in one sitting. It's yeah, and it's. I've also been told yeah, it's it's a little. It looks it looks challenging, so. Um, but yeah, I've been told it's 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 quite an emotional experience, and um, I think the interactive the interactivity is is probably a big part of that. So, I think you'd be surprised by how deep that game's go or that game goes, like in terms of um, its story. Like it goes places that you would not really expect. I, I hmm. think it's even little. I think it's even little aspects. Like imagine how I, I'm trying to imagine like how the game would be. I've only seen footage of it. How the game would be if it was just text of the person saying things to you if you never saw their face or anything. So, yeah. How much of an impact yeah. that would have. Yeah. All right. Um, any particular games that you found that had an excellent story, Brev? Um, well, to be honest, I realize that I sounded like a bit of a marketer right now, but Wasteland Story is like something that I've been really enjoying, just like the number of possibilities that have been popping up lately for me in this game um i like stalker story because of how understated it is just like how everything is just you like finding the right people to talk to like you can miss huge huge parts of that game just because you just didn't find the right person to talk to or they died or something went wrong 
and like just like the revelations that happen they all just come really naturally they're not forced they're not like these stupid like long-winded expositions i don't know i just i like games that, that have that but okay I, I will say i'm a sucker for stuff like mgs where you know liquid standing on top of a giant robot screaming brother <laughs> like i don't know it, it depends would it be safe to say that you enjoy games that are more open with terms of how you can progress the narrative itself yes okay that's respectable there's nothing wrong with that i also feel that um people lately have been kind of obsessed with the idea of very open games like games that have a lot of branching paths and options and stuff like the level of outrage with like something like the walking dead it's like oh it all came back to one point it's like yeah of course it did did you expect any different like it was obviously going to be a diamond shape. Like, it was the same thing with Mass Effect. Like, notwithstanding, like, the problems in the end of that story. But that's like, oh, my choices didn't matter. It's, I don't think that people should obsess so much about a game being as wide as possible. As long as the main storyline is enjoyable. And as long as there isn't, like, big gaps of just, like, why am I playing this game? This story is boring. I don't want to do this. Especially if it's just an only single player experience. Like Kingdoms of Amalur, I dropped that game just because it felt like an MMO. The story felt really, really just tired and didn't really go anywhere for me. You, it's theoretically possible for a game to be more open branch, though, right? But it would cost a lot of money, I believe, is the issue. Yeah. For the most like, part. An example and that time. would be Alpha Protocol, but that game sucks and I don't want to play it, even though the story is good. I, I don't like that game. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I agree with that. Do you, with that. Do you think we'll ever see it? To everyone else, do you think we'll ever see a point where games can be much more uh, widespread in terms of taking very different paths? I know we kind of talked about it earlier with um, the whole ethical, I guess, uh, choices between good or bad or whatever the hell you want to call it. Moral choices. But moral choices nowadays do tend to turn into you know you do something a little bit differently you think it'll ever be you take a whole completely different path and perhaps like a different ending where you think it's always destined to just wind back together near the end until the budgets match larger things yes and until there is such a demand yes just because it's easy it saves time it saves money yeah, I guess visual novels and games like 999 and stuff are the counterpoint, right? And even like The Witcher, like you, that game can end very, very differently depending on like choices made at the beginning. Yeah. All right. Not ah, cool. Did you have a game that you thought had a particularly good story, Pinball? Um. I'm playing one right now uh, for the second time, Catherine, which, um, un- again, kind of falls into the moral choice. It likes to categorize things like, oh, you can choose between chaotic or order, but it, it really just kind of views them as good and bad. I'm not going to spoil any of the endings or any of what happens, so that's really the most detail I can really go in right now. Mm-hmm. Right, did you want to elaborate or no? Um, we did talk about it earlier, but I don't mind talking about it more. I, I do wish it was. Add. I do wish things were a little less blunt about it. Like if, you know, where it really did feel more morally ambiguous than uh, than um, Catherine did. So the the different endings. So well, okay. I think that's 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 important in the distinction of between its its uh, order and chaos, not not good or bad. I know I know I know it's a similar mechanic, but. Uh, it's never, it's never like beaten over your head that this was the wrong choice. Like this is, this is straight up bad. And I think, oh, yeah. I think that distinction enough is is an, is enough to to distinguish it from from not being the typical good bad choices. Like because, like you're saying, there there is a lot of things that happen in that game with the endings that really are kind of morally ambiguous. They don't they don't necessarily come uh, amount to being good or bad. And I don't think the game really treats them that way. It, it, yeah, it just it'd be you know it'd be great to see more yeah more moral 
relativity, I guess, on the uh, end of the player. Yeah. Definitely. Well, well, you know, Catherine being a part of the, you know, some would argue this, but no, Catherine is pretty much part of the Megami Tensei universe. And that's kind of standard is that they follow that the, the law and, and chaotic uh, paradigms. And usually, you know, um, even for Catherine, there is in fact a neutral ending yeah. that's kind of difficult to get. But the interesting thing that they present is that they do their best to present the dangers of uh, extremism. Like you think, well, what's wrong with law? It's good. It protects people. Well, yeah. Yeah, it does do those things to a point. And taken to its extreme can be very, very harmful. It's, it can be oppressive in a sense. Uh, just, as, just as much as extreme chaos can be too much freedom and people still get hurt. Like uh, that whole, think about the chaotic nature of survival of the fittest. Well, you know, some people are going to rise to the top and a lot of people are going to kind of get stomped into the ground a little bit. And so that moral ambiguity is, is something that needs to happen more and more in game stories because that's how the world actually functions. People are told about good, bad, you know, good, evil, so on and so forth because it's a simple concept to quickly grasp. But people ultimately rely on it too much because the real, really, really real world doesn't function that way. It's all, you know, all these in-betweens, the black and white. And uh, SMT has always done a good idea, or not a good idea, has done a good job with putting that forward. That, well, this point of view is a point of view that you can take, but it's not necessarily yeah. the right or the best one. And I think that SMT games have done a great job of making people really examine themselves, no matter what side they make. They said, this is the outcome of what you've chosen. And then you just yeah, have to think that's, about that's it. That's what I was trying to touch on. Yep. Uh, all right, I have a question here. What do you think um, an instance of a game where the story detracted from the experience of the game player, or do you think the story just honestly try to take too much of the camera time. Do you guys know of any examples of games like this? Um, so, I didn't say this earlier, but I am, I am just recently playing through the Metal Gear series. I played the first one a while ago, and I'm working on the second one right now. And I felt... I, I do like what's going on in, in Metal Gear, don't get me wrong, but... And this, this kind of does, doesn't... This doesn't really answer your question, but just... Uh, there was so much exposition at the very beginning of the the game that it, it it made it difficult for me to feel like okay, do I even care about what they're talking about right now? It's a really slow opening. Yeah, it's a really slow opening, and I know I know some uh, I can't think of any off the top of my head, but a lot of games have this have this problem where there, there's a long drawn out opening, and I think in that sense that's when a story most often um, detracts from the experience. Holy shit, you're just reminding me. Yeah, pinball is an excellent suggestion. So All right. Ahead. If, yeah, this... this um, I'll no. try and be short on this, actually. No, uh, the, Legend of Zelda, the Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess. Um, you know, to Metal Gear's credit, every almost, uh, at least at least in the first and second ones, which are the only ones I've touched to date, I still got third and Peace Walker to, uh, mm. to play after I finished two. Um, ever all the almost like I've been told, yeah, about ninety five percent of the narrative element that I've seen, the cutscenes and everything, um, and all the calls and everything, those are skippable. Um, Zelda hasn't ever had that benefit, um, and the story, the story in um, the story in Twilight Princess is bad, but kind of in an obnoxious way that isn't going to let you like skip over it. I, I I just didn't ever come to love any of the characters at all, and I, it's, there was just something about it that just it it it, it read like a, a fan fiction or something. No, I I get what you were saying. Didn't work. The Twilight Prince. There's things about Twilight Princess that I do like, but as far as Zelda games go, it was probably the weakest. I, I know you I don't. Cannot it. stand <laughs> I know. that F fucking game. The dog sections. We're horrible. Yes. Yeah, they were. Yeah, they were really the, bad. the combat, the 
And then after Zant has his uh, kind of uh, disco dance freak out after, um, I, I think that's that's right before you fight him. It's just yeah. it, there are just so many mind-bogglingly bad storytelling decisions. It, now and you want to get your mind off of it, but you just can't skip it. So yeah, it was it was really a case of them trying to, for lack of a better word, go grimdark without the proper tools of doing it. Yeah, and, and it, it, they kind of they they didn't seem as committal to it. Uh, you know, they had they had uh, muted colors and uh, they had bloom in you know the twilight yeah. the twilight segments, which they they had they had kind of a nice look the twilight yeah. segments, but um, yeah. you you know they still had the only the only two characters designed with any you know actual like um, human kind of looking everything were uh, Link and Zelda. The rest are all the same kind of you know. Uh, caricatures of varying gonkness. So, it, you, you know, you need to kind of go all the way with the, the realism thing or just, you know, j just drop it because, you know, most of the people that um, were signed on to Zelda at this point had played through Wind Waker and uh, the DS games and really they, they didn't mind the, you know, how how it looked as long as it just kind of played like a Zelda game and the story just wasn't terrible. And the, the story yeah. was a train wreck. That's not the that's not inherently the issue. That it's just that the train wreck was something you were forced to see. Uh, I would say also that Wind Waker <laughs> is the exact opposite of uh, Twilight, uh, of Twilight Princesses because um, it had such a massive back end of the story cut out and still managed to be entertaining throughout. While Twilight Princess was a complete story, and I didn't give a shit about it from the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and it, it's and it's kind of. Sorry. No. Go ahead. I was just gonna say it's something something that Twilight Princess shared as a problem with the uh, with uh, the the subsequent uh, or this the subsequent uh, Skyward Sword is just how long the opening was. Like, it's just it's just like I get it. Everybody who's anybody that cares about games has played a Zelda game in the last fifteen years. They know the basic controls. But yet we it, are our our opening s segments of the games are getting longer and longer and longer. You know, I got this close to getting um, Skyward Sword. Skyward Sword is the only um, Skyward Sword and Majora's Mask are the only two uh, Zelda games I haven't been able to get a hold of. Um, well, Majora's Mask I just haven't been able to get a hold of. Um, I, I have an N sixty four with an expansion pack just right in front of me, but I, I can't find a, a copy at a good price. So, um, but with uh, Skyward Sword. Um, I, I've just heard so. I've just heard and seen so many awful things about it. I just don't. I don't want to touch it. I want to have my illusion of Zelda games having you know a standard to them broken. So, you know, I, 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 I'm certainly biased because the Zelda series is is like it, it, the the Legend of Zelda was the very first video game I ever played. I've loved the series as long as I've been alive and can remember. So I'm a little biased. So I'm. I always walk into a Zelda game trying harder to look for things that I can take out of them. So while I can't recommend Skyward Sword, I think there are things in it that are worthwhile. Like specifically um, the desert the desert zone in that game. Yep. It's fantastic. And it just unfortunately it kind of suffers from the, from bad bosses. <laughs> and, yeah, yeah. and there's 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 just the one boss in Skyward Sword that was amazing where you're just like hacking p p parts of armor off this guy and, but then all of the rest of them were just just boring I, I saw the imprisoned who i believe you fight about three or four times um the first the first form um you, you know i'm not i'm not one to push consistency or you know art styles onto people but um in a zelda game like this where they're trying to apparently they're trying to go for the uh, impressionist style Channeling the Croft brothers isn't exactly the the way to go for designing a boss. So you know, it looks it looks like something that being like the the Spike Jones where the wild things are, mm -hmm. or you know, HR puppy <laughs> stuff. Yeah. It, that was just the that was just That's... that was the goofiest thing since uh, Zan's freak out and and Twilight yeah. Princess is like, am I really really am I playing a Zelda game? It's like Jesus God. That's actually something interesting about Sky Skyward Sword specifically. Um, all of the major console Zelda games, uh, the the art direction and just the the visuals of the of the game contributed in some way to the overall tone of the story. Like Wind Waker was all full of life, 
and it was vibrant and it was it was uh, the even the, the the story was very much about taking that kind of stuff back and uh the, the, just as an example but in skyward sword the art didn't really do anything for the themes presented and it was just it was just kind of a shame yeah uh, I agree with these. The, the DS game wasn't bad, but did anyone else have a game that they wanted to talk about where the story just simply cut too much time into the gameplay and Assassin's just ruined it? To <laughs> walking a, going to the villa, walking to the villa, listening to this guy talk about how great the villa used to be, and how it's not great anymore, and how you can make it great in the future, but you gotta make money. Just... It felt like I was like sitting at like someone trying to pitch me a timeshare. It was like it's a twenty minute scene. You're allowed to jump around and stuff, but if you get too far it fails the mission. It is the worst opening. And <laughs> that's the opening of the game. It's like it's like briefly after the opening opening of the game. It's like right when you're becoming an assassin. Because like the actual like it, it's the worst thing because it does this boring long scene. After you get into, like, a fist fight on the streets of Venice, which is, like, kind of like, okay, let's see where this goes. This guy seems kind of fun, and then it's just, like, long-winded dialogue. Yeah, I guess the prime example of where stories tend to really cut into the gameplay, ironically, I think, is uh, MMOs, actually. I mean, how many people that play MMOs just click through the quest and don't really give a shit about what it says? They just want to get the mission and go do the quest. Yeah. I, I think that there that most people definitely don't read the qu- the quests, but like for larger events and stuff like that, I I used to play WoW when I was younger and um it was like I wouldn't pay attention to like random fetch quests like, "Oh, my I lost my bow in the woods. Can you get it?" But if it was like a tuning for molten core or something, and I was paying attention. I'm like, oh, what does this mean? I wanted to like understand what a tuning meant. Yeah, uh, Baldwin brings up a good point, and I'm one of those weirdos that like always read like every quest for no good reason. I got way too into to WoW lore, and just it, it ended up just being dumb, anyways. But um, uh, Baldwin brings up a good point uh, about the secret world, while. It wasn't a, a particularly great game. The story was, was really fun to experience. And even though it was... That's because you identified with that guy. Do what? That's because you identified with that police officer. <laughs> You're basically him. I am basically him. Andy. <laughs> Deputy Andy. Fucking Deputy Andy. But he's, he actually has a small role. But I, and I actually need to finish The Secret World. But like, what was going on in there actually was interesting. Because it drew, it drew from a lot of of like mythos that that just it made it interesting to see how it played out in an apocalyptic setting so it was actually fun to uh to to listen to what they were saying and then understand as opposed to just like give me this quest i'm gonna collect something and it was it 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 was that was intentional because they only allow you to pick up like five quests at a time yeah Secret World uh, seemed pretty interesting. But at the same time, uh, MMOs definitely just skip out the quest dialogue. I mean, I used to try and read it, but when I'm playing with other people and they aren't, yeah. you know, when they are yeah. skipping, it becomes really hard to keep yeah, with Yeah, I get frustrated when... Because, like, I don't like playing MMOs alone anymore. It's just boring as hell. But, like, I still have that compulsion to, to sit there and read the quest text, but my friends are just like, let's go! I'm just like... Ah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm just surprised nobody has uh, mentioned well, Metal Gear that. Solid Four. That, that, that <laughs> detracts from gameplay. When like I thought people were just you know being hyperbolic or just exaggerating when they said hour yeah. and a half cutscenes, they weren't fucking around. I, I don't mind <laughs> like, hour and a half. Sorry, they're really long. I. <laughs> Here's what ended up happening. I just, in fact, I, I didn't even bother to play the game when it first came out one because I didn't have a PS3. But I just went and found, you know, someone who had strung all the cutscenes together and sat down and watched like 
a five, six hour movie of Metal Gear Solid 4, I was like, why do I need to play it at oh, this no. point? <laughs> yeah. Like, it, it's it's great. The gameplay stuff is great. I have the game. I just haven't even, I haven't even gotten around to playing it. I've played like the first ten minutes because I know how it ends. So you can be a little yeah. too heavy that, on that story. That seems to be a thing. I just in the I, like I said, I'm working my way through the Metal Gear series now. But my experience with Kojima is just he he likes to go on these long tangential um, bouts of exposition, and I guess. Um, I guess four just took that to like its natural extreme. There was, oh, go ahead. There was a really good little like brief interview with one of the um, game designers on uh, Metal Gear Solid Two, and they're just talking to him. And it's like, what was the design process like? And he's like, well, one day Mr. Kojima said to me, "I want the main hero to be a man named Raiden, and I want him to be very beautiful." And then I, then I sat there for a moment and thought, and then I realized Mr. Kojima was serious. A day later, he comes to me and tells me that Metal Gear Solid 2 needs a vampire. I paused and thought about it, and I looked at him again, and I realized he was serious. And this guy just looks like the most depressed person ever. I think it's I... just because Kojima's been around for so long that he can get away with whatever he wants. Yeah, I, I hate to, um, to kind of switch gears a bit about uh, Vamp. Um, I'm... Where am I right now? I just beat um, Fat Man. I've ju- I've literally just beaten Fat Man. That's the exact point I am in uh, Metal Gear Solid Two. I've been taking the game very slowly. Um, it, I I really don't like Vamp right now. Vamp or the the girl he's with because uh, yeah they seem like they're just kind of shoehorned in just for an excuse to have a vampire and um it's Wait, yeah I I really do you not know I feel really out of place. Do you not know his connection to the to the tanker part? I'm sorry, the, um... You know how the first part is on the tanker and the second part's on Big Shell? Yeah. Um, do you not know Vamp's connection to the tanker section of the game? I don't either. either. Um, maybe I haven't gotten to that part yet, or it's, something like it's, that? It, it's never explicit, or it's never stated in, um... Wait, I don't think it's stated in a discussion, but I think there's, like, intel that you get somewhere. Sorry, I played Metal Gear Solid oh. 2, like, ten years ago. But like, <laughs> I'm trying yeah. to remember, but there's definitely a part where you, you know how there was like the, the briefing going on with Metal Gear and there's a dude giving the speech to all the soldiers and you're sneaking around behind them? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's a relationship between the dude giving the speech and Vamp, and let me tell you, oh. it's fucking crazy! Yeah, uh, uh, and then there's, uh, yeah. then there's the girl, uh, Fortune, Fortune, I, uh... I, I I hope something happens with with them later on that um, kind of makes it a little better. But um, I I hate to kind of switch gears. Have we already kind of covered where games where the story you know is really it they kind of interact very nicely the story in the game? Because um, um no I don't think we've mentioned examples of that. Uh, I, we can I, talk about that if you want. Oh, no I, I'm sorry yeah I'm sorry if anyone has any other examples of uh, games where the story kind of got in the got in the way of things. Uh, not off the top of my head. All right. Well, um, I, I, what game do you think it really harmonized really well? Um, Bully, which was my first Rockstar open world game. Um, I got it on yeah. PlayStation Two and then Xbox, and then finally on Windows, which is the one I've been playing. I think I'll, that'll probably be my first uh, PC stream ever. Um, and it's uh, yeah, it's it, the uh, the way you interact with other other people kind of changes as the story progresses. Uh, right now, I've kind of um, I'm in good standing with all the clicks. So, but um, before that, before I did my missions with the nerds, I, I, all the jocks would would try beating me up, and I'd have such a hard time going through the football field and everything. Now I'm I'm in good standing with everybody, and uh, it feels great. I think the only people I have issues with are the townies and the prefects, who you always have issues with uh, throughout the game. So, it's um, the the everyone. It, I think it has like everyone is their own individual character all the clicks have their own individual people and um that's i i don't know how new of a thing that is but that's that's interesting for um for a game released on uh the playstation 2 so yeah uh anyone else think where there's games where the story and the gameplay just merge so um, wonderfully Bastion. uh eco and shadow of the colossus 
Shadow of the Claws, this was fantastic. I really, man, the the one um, Colossus that flies around that you have to kind of ride up on the horse and grab on, that was still to this day probably one of the most intense moments I've experienced in a video game, that and Ace Combat 5, <laughs> the second to last mission. I would say, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I would say uh, Dante's Inferno. I never, I never played really? that one. Really? Really? Well, it, let's put it this way. I mean, I, I think I think it's one of the greatest games of the last generation. I mean, it didn't get as good reception, but it the controls are very tight, they're very crisp. Just as just talking gameplay stuff, and the whole point of Dante's Inferno is you're going through Dante's Inferno, like you know you're playing out the Divine Comedy, but all those different layers and circles of hell are represented really well in gameplay elements. You know, you go through the, the place where the suicides are, and there are plants that will make you suicidal and make Dante kill himself. Like, they did a great job of taking this, you know, classic work of fiction and actually converting all of it into gameplay elements. You know, uh, you go through the circle of hell that deals with lust, and it's some pretty explicit stuff. Like, there's giant... Uh, lady parts on the walls and you see all kinds of like crazy crazy stuff in that game and they just did a good job of blending those into gameplay mechanics and it's really easy to understand like i ran into more people who then became interested in reading the divine comedy because of that game they're like like is this how it is i'm like well no this is like a fictional take on a fictional work like they tried to build a game around this yeah, idea there, and they did a pretty good job are there like, movies in, the game, in the book or what's going on here i was, I was gonna <laughs> say they were probably pretty disappointed <laughs> that is a long 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 book and if they go to the other two in the series then jesus christ they're in for more disappointment because hell is the cool part You know, it, it's one of the ways done right. It's like, it's seriously one of my favorite games. I think it was like the second game I got a platinum on or whatever because I was just like, holy cow, this know, is great. I read the book before I saw that game. And when I saw that game, I'm like, what are you doing? Why does he have a scythe? Why is he stitching himself and screaming? What is happening? I don't know. It just like sort of put me off <laughs> because of my context uh, of knowing what the original work was like. Right. Yeah, it's it's very very it's very separated in that aspect. Like we know, you know, Virgil is supposed to have taken him him Dante Alighieri down through it and just hell, was yeah. a tour of you know the, the hell. Where this, it's the Dante being presented here is like a crusader and all that. Like they they're very clear that these are two separate people, so to speak, that share a common name. And it just so happens, like, it's, he's not a writer, you know, or any anything like that. It's just like, this guy's on the classic trope quest of, oh, I gotta go get my lady back because she's been dragged to hell or whatever. But they do a good job of just introducing people to that content who otherwise might not be. And that, I think, is truly the value. If, if, a, if a game's narrative makes you go explore the world outside of the game when you're done, like, uh, well, you know, like Dante's Inferno or like Persona. You'll you'll hear about all these different folklore and mythological creatures and things like that, and if it makes you go, that's really cool. Wait, is this a thing? Like, and you want to go read about it? The game has done a great service to, you know, just humanity and mankind in that way. That's an interesting yeah. way to look at it. I'm surprised that you made such a good case for a game like Dante's Inferno. <laughs> and I'm not saying that with any level of snark. I'm actually right. saying that that's pretty sick that you did that. Yeah, and, and, and like, look at all the different games you might have on your own shelf that might take inspiration from real content or things like that. Look at Assassin's Creed. It's It does the same thing. It's talking about 
you know, different historical events or people who may have actually existed and they built a fictional narrative around it. And if it makes you go, holy crap, that's crazy. That's cool. I want to go learn about that. Then we can't say a game is, is bad for doing that. It's like playing the Oregon Trail, you know? Like, you sit down, you're like, man, that dysentery is a bitch. But if it makes you go out and go, what was that life like? And you go learn about it, how can we say it's bad? Yeah, if I go out and actually hunt animals, then it's good. <laughs> The thing is that, like, the level of overlap between people who read, like, what would be called, like, serious literature, or whatever you want to call it, and people who play video games, I don't know what that overlap is like. I don't want to stereotype gamers too much by saying it's like, they don't read that kind of stuff, but at the same time, I don't think that the audience that is into that kind of thing is as massive, and I also don't think that a lot of people are as um, introspective, that they don't look back on that game to try and think of something new or like trying to explore um, an idea within that game, like you would. I think that a lot of gamers would be like, oh yeah, that story was good, man. Like, you know, I enjoyed that. Eight out of ten. And then move on to the next game or whatever. They wouldn't really take the time to try and look at that thing. Yeah. Oh, no, I don't, I don't yeah. disagree with you. Which is to just yeah. say, I agree. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know why did I double negative that. Um, yeah, no, I, I, I agree with you. Like, most people aren't like that. But every now and again, you'll catch someone who is like, you know, that was really fun. You say, you know, this is based on real stuff. And they go, really? Tell me more. You know, even if it's just one people out of every 100 or 1,000 or whatever, it's still one more person who decided to go educate themselves on real topics and real things that have occurred in the world, you know? We, we take yeah. our wins where we can get them. That yeah. Makes a lot of sense. I think, yeah, I think one of the greatest examples for me, or best examples, I believe, of a game that has gameplay and storytelling mixed together so wonderfully would be Diablo 1. Uh, just very very atmospheric game and just i think the biggest thing that changed between diablo 1 and diablo 2 and why i think diablo 1 is better is the fact that you couldn't run in diablo 1 there's this very slow methodical pace and it really helped made you more immersive it make you feel like you're actually traversing into pretty much hell more or less and that's what i think yeah. All right. Well, let's see here. How are we uh, for time on everybody? I'll probably be going in the next um, half hour, so I have work tomorrow. Yeah, I probably have like half an hour. Yeah. Probably... Okay. What well, do you guys want to wrap it up here? Because um, we've been taught me words and three dog have been talking for a while. Yeah. But it was a, yeah. it was a good discussion. Yeah. All right, well, let's uh, I'll call everyone out, and you guys can chill or make whatever you want known to be known. So we'll start with you, Brev. Um, well, look forward to some experience required. And other than that, um, we have um, a comic in the works as well, but that oh, right. is a bit off. Um, and I hesitate to speak more about that also. <laughs> <laughs> it's a work in progress. Uh, it's basically written, but still being drawn okay you have a twitter or something and you want people to follow you at hell no i'll show okay. you later it's more or less the same thing <laughs> uh what about uh you johnny pinball um i'm probably gonna be uh i'm gonna try out experimental streams of bully on my pc and then uh maybe later in the month when i have to move somewhere else um i have to move down to california i'm gonna try and see if i can get um a capture card and a PlayStation stream setup. So, um, oh, and you can follow okay. me on Twitter at uh, jpinball underscore gaming. Um, I'll I'll try and update and say something awesome every now and then. So, yeah, you're still starting up, though. I'm, I'm still so. starting up. Yep, it'll be a while before okay. um, everything kind of Is gets up and running. So, yes. All right, and uh, words, one of the two guests of honor, <laughs> as I like to call you two. Stop it. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, look forward to some experience required. It was kind of actually a surprise to sort of like announce it here. We haven't really talked about it at all. But um, you can follow us uh, 
at Red Ink VNs, like I linked in the chat earlier. And then you can follow me at, uh, at Wordsmith on Twitter as well. I'll link that in the chat before I go. And okay. yeah, just uh, I'm thankful if there's any interest. Uh, and it's been a lot of fun, guys, really. No, no, I'm thankful that you came on. Thank you for reaching out to me. Uh, I mean, you're the reason why I decided to go with this topic. So Appreciate it. Uh, no problem. Uh, Oliver slash Three Dog, uh, thank you for coming on, man. Do you want to promote any of your products or books or lectures or Twitters? Well, <laughs> well I've got I've got a whole lot of stuff. Let's hear it. Um, long long short, find me on Twitter and on Facebook, both at uh, Oliver B Campbell. Um, as far as just reading more what I have to say about building narrative and storytelling just in general, uh, you can go find my WordPress blog at betweenhimandher.wordpress.com. Um, and finally, just as far as the actual stories that I've written, uh, we have Rabbit in the Road is available on Amazon and Barnes & Noble. You can pick those, pick that up as an ebook or as a paperback. And what is this about? Um, it's a, the book. It's a period piece uh, set in the 60s, and 1960s, leading up to about the 1980s. Uh, it's kind of an urban fantasy that touches on, uh, think of it as a kind of offshoot take on the idea of uh, uh, X-Men, in a way. People with, you know, kind of mutated power sets, but they're very unusual power sets, and it just kind of focuses on a single individual trying to get away from uh, the person who's tracking her down because of what power she can provide to him. Uh, it's, it's a novella. It's pretty short. It's about 30,000 words, and uh, it's done very well. If you just take a look at the, the star ratings on that, it's been out for a few years. And then the other book that I have available is... Uh, the Twisted World, The Dusk Harbinger, and that story was was my take on high fantasy and just my general dis distaste with the genre over the years. And I just basically sat down and rather than pitching a bitch about what everyone else is writing, I said, well, how about I just sit down and create some fantasy that I know that someone like me would enjoy. So, And this is a different put... book? Oh, what's, yes. it, what's this one called? This the different... fantasy one? Uh, the Twisted World, okay. one, book one, The Dust Carbinger. All right. And uh, it's it's uh, it's pretty cool, I would think. I mean, I'm kind of biased. I think everything I do is cool. Uh, no, it's uh, it's high fantasy, and it's actually it takes inspiration from many of the games that we've talked about right here on on stream. Uh, it's inspired by EverQuest Two, uh, Stalker, and you know the thing that that was based on, Roadside Picnic. Uh, it takes inspiration from Legend of Mana, Secret of Mana, all kinds of stuff like that. So I think that people who are, you know, our, our gamers here are going to be a lot more interested in that content. Okay. And uh, I have to ask this. It's a personal question. Um, how are you enjoying P4U2? Because I know I also picked that up. Assuming you did pick you know, it up. You know, Ultimax is really interesting. The changes surprised me. Um, I found that it was it's it's a little hard to get out of combos sometimes, uh, you know after you're, you're getting your shit rocked. But what I really do enjoy is the shadow variations on everyone. Like once I got in there and just saw it, I was like, holy crap, this is actually really interesting. Like the shadow versions are the same versions that were in Arena, like or just the regular versions of those characters, and everyone else got kind of a, a revamp or whatever. So I thought that was pretty cool. I am, I've been maining with Junpei, trying to work the strikeout <laughs> system. Yeah, I'm playing Ken myself. Did you have anything else you wanted to plug? No, no. Okay. Um, well, thanks again to everyone for joining and for everyone watching. This has been Shillfish. This has been brought to you by SpellsFire.com. Uh, we're not out yet, but it is a community-driven site. So anyone can come and post, and you can come and mirror your own sites. Like, for example, uh, 3Dog, if on your WordPress blog you talked about video games, you are more than welcome to come and mirror that on our site, and you know we will properly credit you and stuff like that. Just give you another I outlet to give you another outlet to get more viewers. We're completely okay with that. That's actually what we want. Um, so look forward to that site. 
And thanks again to everyone for joining and listening. Please do keep me posted when that comes up because I'm yeah, really interested would. to see. Yeah, and I'm probably going to buy one yeah, of your books. You guys are. <laughs> <laughs> the, well, thank uh, you. Yeah, you sold some books, at the very least. At the very least. No, it, um, I was very glad they came on through. Dog, it was a very interesting conversation, especially the Eastern versus Western stuff. That was very uh, revealing to me, and I'm not going to say I'm the best at knowledge about that, but I do know a little bit above it, so it was interesting. Well, thank you. And uh, chill our side, of course, everyone. I mean, that spells fired on Twitter. Um, and if you ever want me to come moderate or discuss on your stream or whatever, feel free to shoot me an invite. Actually, you've done a great job moderating, and I know that there are quite a few people that need some conversation uh, moderators in the space right now, so I am going to have to throw them in your That's direction. Good. Definitely. I will gladly talk. But no, thanks again. Uh, we can stop the stream, but if you guys want to stick around and shoot some shit, that's fine. But definitely great conversations. Well, thank you for having me on. No, thank you. <laughs> <laughs>